I please the court, Mr. Hurley. Uh, good morning. My name is John Fitzgibbons. I'm a lawyer in Tampa, and I represent Cameron Heron in this appeal. Uh, I would like to reserve five minutes. All right, Your Honor. Thank you. You got. It. I have a question, preliminary question. You broke your case, your argument into three issues in your brief. Are you going to argue three issues separately, or are they kind of overlapping to some degree, at least issues one and two? Your Honor, the first uh, two issues are the significant issues, the disparity and uh, the abuse of discretion. The third issue, uh, we don't feel is as important as the other two. The other two are interrelated. Because disparity of sentencing could be part and parcel of downward uh, downward departure justification, right? Yes. So I'm, I'm, I'm not necessarily, I don't think there's a bright line separating those two issues. I just didn't know if you wanted to bring that out to my attention so I could focus on each issue separately or you, you don't have a preference. I think that some of the facts are going to relate to both okay. and I'll try to That's fine. do my best. Thank you, sir. This is a horrible case. There's no dispute about it. There's nothing good about it. It's tragic all the way around. The, the events in the case took place in about 30 seconds on a uh, May day in 2018. The two cars, the two young men stopped at the Bayshore Boulevard and Gandhi and 30 seconds and maybe one or two or three more later. Mr. Fitzgibbons, you did a fabulous job briefing this. And we, you, you did a fabulous job briefing this and arguing it in the trial court and we've read the well, record you, and the briefs. So I have a question for you that ties a little bit to what Judge Volante asked. And it is, I was, I reviewed your arguments. I have a little trouble hearing Judge sometimes. So, sorry, sorry, let me yell at you a little bit here, so. um, Can you hear me a little yes, bit? Thank you. Sorry about that. I reviewed your arguments pretty much separately, recognizing that issue one is a predicate to issue two. And with regard to issue one, right, the downward departure, we've got, you've got a very difficult standard of review there, such that the, the bottom line question is, would any reasonable, is there no reasonable trial judge that would have refused to downward depart? I would like to focus on issue two, just assuming you know you, it gives you a legal predicate the the fact that uh, I'm sorry the fact that there was a disparity and so what I think the fundamental inquiry comes in under Sanders right was the trial court is justified in departing on this only if the record establishes beyond a reasonable doubt that, the, that this defendant, that Mr. Heron's culpability was no greater than that of, of Mr. Baronet, right? And the, which leads to the same problem that I think you have with issue one, and this is where I'd really like you to address your, the points. Isn't the trial court's determination of the answer to that Sanders question a discretionary determination? Each case stands on its own facts. It's a judgment call. It's with the Fernandez case committed to the trial court's discretion. And your, your opponent has argued that they weren't equally culpable for, I think, four reasons, having to do with the black box data, the fact that Barano was 17, uh, and that Mr. Heron's car through random or into, you know, however it did, Mr. Heron's car is the one that actually had contact. So can you address where the trial court legally erred in refusing to downward depart on the basis of disparity? Your Honor, I think you have zoomed in on the key issue here. Uh, the uh, equal culpability of Mr. Barano and Mr. Heron. And we think the court uh, uh, respectfully got it wrong. Uh, and for a number of reasons, because I think that drives so much in this case. Uh, first of all, the, um, uh, the state, uh, the judge did not give a lot of reasons in his, uh, uh, when he was pronouncing uh, his decision. Uh, he seemed to rely very heavily on the state. And I even 
brought along a couple of the state's comments that they said during the uh, arguments. Your Honor, we're here today because of the actions of Cameron Heron and quite frankly, Cameron Heron alone. Main argument, which is the most obvious, Verano did not strike the two people. I can't stress it enough. I don't know why it's so difficult to comprehend the difference between this defendant and Verano. Cameron Heron killed them. His vehicle struck and killed him. But I think that that ignores the facts that we tried to develop uh, in our brief. Two young men started out together. Uh, they're, drag one, they're drag racing. Pardon? They were drag racing. Vehicular, this is a form of vehicular homicide where it's almost presumptively, they're intertwined, obviously. Inextricably intertwined, and, we believe. And the evidence is what it is. We have one witness who says that uh, Mr. Barano's vehicle was in front and that, that Cameron's vehicle, would that he wouldn't have been able to avoid. I forget the witness's name, Lewis, I think. And then we have some other evidence that seems to contradict that. So there, these are all evidentiary determinations that the trial court is making. And I'm just going to jump on the side for a minute here, a little segue. I was surprised to, based on my own research and the fact that nobody briefed it, to learn that there is no proportionality downward departure case, and you tell me if I'm wrong here, in involving drag racing vehicular homicide sentencing, because they're always going to have two defendants, at least. And it was a surprise to me that for as long as the statute's been on the books, we haven't had this case in the state of Florida. Is it, am I right about that? Uh, yes, Judge, because we spent a lot of time looking <laughs> thinking the exact same thing. It just seems so normal that this would uh, have occurred on different occasions. And that, and that puts us back, and I'm sorry, I don't want to beat the dead horse or use up all your time. But I think that brings us back to what, the, what our role is reviewing what the trial court did. And our role is limited to trying to find a legal error uh, on the, with the presumption that the trial court acted correctly and the evidence supports that decision. The, what did the trial court do here that constituted an, exer a, a, an abuse of its discretion in deciding that these two defendants were not equally culpable? They're based on evidentiary factors, admittedly narrow, but we've looked at the whole record, which is very well developed. And the trial court there's a view of this, and, and I understand the empathy and sympathy in this case on both sides, but there's a view of this that the trial court was empowered to and did exercise his discretion to resolve these evidentiary differences and conclude that these two were not equally culpable. And, and I think that's the case law that we're confronted with. So help us find a legal error, or what you say is the legal error. Your Honor, I don't think that the uh, evidence was that contradictory. As the young men drove up a short boulevard, different people at different stages of the way observed things. Sometimes Mr. Herron was in the lead, sometimes Mr. Heron was in the lead. Uh, the state charged this, they, ch they arrested them together, they charged them the exact same information, they charged them with uh, racing. Uh, the state could have charged Verano with racing alone and not vehicular homicide. They chose to put them together and the Lucio case talks about the state's theory. That's been the state's theory in that particular case. That's been the state's theory all the way that the two of them were racing. And, uh, and I think that what Mr. Lewis said is that there's just no dispute that at one moment, uh, Mr. Barano's ahead. He sees the woman and child. He cuts in front of my client. As Lewis said, my client had to go around him. Uh, and boom. And then, unfortunately, it happened. So not one Barano. of the most compelling aspects of your argument on this, on this point is that the trial court accepted the, when you went through the plea colloquy or the colloquy at sentencing that the trial court accepted, used one set of facts for both sentence, to accept the plea for Barano and to sentence your client. And that, that argument has some appeal since the trial court, that gives you a place to argue that they were exactly the same. Talk to, talk to me about that. You're right, Judge, because we did have the, uh, as we put in our brief on this, that the uh, plea colloquy, we went first, uh, the state read the stipulated factual basis, we agreed, and then Marino uh, comes in right after us, as we assume, and they don't even read 
the stipulated facts. They just they stipulated that we agree what was read previously. Uh, it just, and your opponent, who will address this, is likely to say, well, we were at the end of a very long, emotionally charged day, and we're on Zoom, and the facts are the facts, but that doesn't necessarily mean that there's equal culpability. I think that's what it is. Excuse me, Your Honor. The plea took place on December 31st, and Verno was sentenced on the spot pursuant to his agreement with the state. Everybody there felt six years is fine. Uh, then our sentencing was several months later. Did you ask for a PSI at that point? No. The judge ordered a PSI on his own report or her own report. There's, there's reference to a PSI in the, in the transcript, but we don't actually have the PSI. I don't remember seeing one, Judge, and if there was one, I'm sorry for that. We knew we were, we knew all along this was a mitigation case. We, we just looked Well, so, so my question is on your first issue, at least. If you proved mitigation and there was a legal basis where the judge could have downward departed, but then the judge has to do the swaying process under the case law to decide is, if that downward departure is the best sentence for this particular defendant. So my question is, if you prove downward departure grounds exist, are you saying the court's obligated to downward departure at that point, or are they still engage in that second step and do the independent analysis? Well, we would argue that, that we set forth on the this is abuse of discretion argument, the, the first one, that that we presented. I, I know abuse of discretion is a very big hurdle to get over. There's no doubt about it. But we felt we presented enough that when we look at the uh, definition of abuse of discretion and they talk about uh, the, the, the um, Huff case and the Banks case talk about logic and justification as part of the definition of abuse of discretion. We, we just think with everything we presented, it was not logical to give one defendant 24 years, not depart, and another one six. So case, this case law you allude to comes from death penalty cases, where there's co-defendants, felony murder, things like that. And they generally, there's recourse if they don't get the same sentence. But you don't have any case law to say you have that same right to the same sentence as a, as another co-defendant. And I'm, I, I see distinctions here. I mean, I was a trial judge for a long time. I don't, if the state comes up, so we've got a plea negotiation on party A and you give me the facts and I can see the distinction. Well, someone's left holding the bag. In this case, it was your client. He didn't get that benefit because obviously the state refused to give a negotiated plea to the person they felt was more culpable. And the facts on the record, the judge said, geez, you make the contact, he was speeding at a, was 170 miles an hour the night before, the day of, the day of. It doesn't show, and you have an alleged adult, 18 years old versus 17. So there's enough for the judge to hang its hat on in, in approving plea bargain A and not going with the down departure. Same reason the judge didn't have to give a YO. Didn't, I, I don't think there was a, a request for a YO in this case, was there? Yeah, there was, yes. The judge rejected out, yes. out of hand, but you're not, that's not part of your appeal. And that was one of our uh, grounds for a uh, 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 departure. Okay. And, 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 and the judge, I think it just boils down to the, 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 this issue of culpability. I, we just don't see daylight between the two young men uh, in this case. If, if the conclusion is there, uh, is a big difference in call, culpability, and that's one thing. But this could not have happened without both of them in concert. Well, here's the other thing that's a little bit confusing. Straighten me out on this. This is a vehicular homicide case. Yes. That emanated from drag racing. Well, so street racing. What, why would both people have to be charged with vehicular homicide if only one uh, made the impact? Because I think that the state theory here was to join them together because they were concerned about certain things, one being that the impact speed was below the speed limit. And so they, they, they wanted to get the racing in there, I believe, <clears throat> so that uh, to help their case. Um, and, I, 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 and I keep coming back to the culpability. Their theory was it was, it was two individuals racing along and the woman is struck. The only difference is at the last second, the other guy appears in front of my guy, and it happens. It could have been either one of them. And that, that's 
That's equal culpability. It seems that they charge them again as reduced to some conspirators and strictly yeah, you just test your five minutes. I don't know if you want to save that rebuttal or if you, or if you want to come back and I could work. talk for a long time. I just want to say everyone could. Okay. Thank you. Thank you so much. I'll save you five minutes. Response. Hey, please support Jonathan Hurley, the Office of the Attorney General, representing the Apple League State of Florida in this case. Your Honor, real quick to, to bullet point this. The, the, there was no error in, in the process that the court applied during sentencing when it comes to following banks. Number one, the court, there were six issues, uh, basis is asserted uh, in their motion for uh, downward departure. Um, all six were recognized as legal basis by the and court. Five were accepted as proven. Five were accepted as one was not. But from a standpoint of let's analyze the was a legal error. Uh, first of all, the court recognized all six. The when it comes to the one that it did not, the disparity issue, the uh, Ellie would, would, would argue that the record supports the trial court's finding that. The evidence was insufficient to to, to 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 reduce this sentence from the lowest from the LPS from the, from the uh, so it, I think your opponent has conceded that that's sort of a a, a throwaway issue here. Well, issue three, but you know, stay with me. One of his arguments, and let's start at the top with issue one, is that the trial court did abuse his discretion, among other things, because it was the trial court found, and I don't think there's any serious dispute, that five of the six bases were proven, were met, and disparity was the open question. But I, if I understand his argument on issue one correctly, it is that that alone sets up a good argument for abuse of discretion because you have five out of six uh, mitigators for downward departure and the trial judge blew past all of them and denied it. Can you tell us why that wasn't an abuse of discretion? Well, to, uh, to respond to your comment that the court blew right past them, I think if you read the record, I don't think that's- I did read the record. Oh, right. Right. And I don't think, I think if you, I think the court, trial court painstakingly went through the the totality when I say blue right past them, Mr. Hurley, what I mean is he didn't forgive me for a misuse of that term. He disregarded them in his decision making, even though all it's a significant quantum of mitigators, five out of six. And your opponent's position is that was an abuse of discretion. If you've got five out of six and one's in question, he should have granted a downward departure. This is issue one. Abuse of discretion is a high hurdle. He's saying it meets that hurdle. What's your response? With all due respect, I don't think the court uh, ignored those first five. Let's say, I, I, you're missing my point. Yeah. I'm not suggesting that Judge Nash ignored anything. Mm -hmm. What I'm suggesting is that everybody agreed. Nobody questions that five of the, five of the six mitigators in question were met. One was in question. It's certainly the subject of a legitimate debate. And nonetheless, the trial court didn't find a basis to depart. And is that an abuse of discretion? I, I read this record. I know that this judge took it seriously. We're taking it seriously. The state took it seriously. But the question now is, was that an abuse of the trial court's discretion on this record? And tell me why it wasn't. It's not. And the reason it's not is... Because the court, again, is looking at all the aggravating and mitigating factors. And, and this is a judgment call. This is a subjective judgment call. As long as the court does its weighing and examines the, rec the, the record in totality, and yes, there were um, mitigating circumstances that you referenced to, Your Honor. There was also aggravating circumstances, which well, weren't the, the, so the weren't weighing those, process wait, is then, a judgment then, then you've taken us right to issue two. And weren't those aggravating circum, your opponent's position clearly is that the aggravators, as you called them, aren't they present across the board equally in both of these defendants' conducts leading to this crime? 
this end? Some of them may be, but there's also uh, uh, distinguishing facts and circumstances for between the two co-defendants. If you, if you, again, going back to Sanders, the record has to show beyond a reasonable doubt that they're equally uh, culpable in this case. Uh, just looking at the, just reading the transcript of the plea hearing, you see that there's debate in essence, even though, again, this is the, the plea call, call piece is justifying the charge. It's not settling who is more culpable in this case. It's not saying, okay, plea hearing, we've decided this is, they're both equally culpable. That's not what happened here. You've so that's your, that's your point to respond to the rely using the same colloquy for both for both to accept the Senate to accept the plea and then as the basis for the colloquy sentence. supports the state's position the fact that on the record which which was not objected to the colloquy uh, you've got two eyewitnesses first of all there's no question the race there's no question that they're alternating positions of who's ahead and who's behind and so forth okay that's on that, that seems to be they're both they're, endangering the pedestrians and other drivers. And then to the answer Judge Lunch's question, why was it a more homicide? Vehicle homicide, you, you drive right, you drove recklessly, and because of that driving recklessly, you caused the death. Okay? And they had causation. So that, that could go along with that doesn't mean you were equally culpable. That just means you caused it, and your cause could have been this far, and this person's cause could have been up here. Well, you, and that's you, enough to get you know you for the crime. of death penalty cases. The death penalty have aggravators and mitigators usually decided by the jury, sometimes the judge. And you don't, you're not, you, one aggravator can outweigh a hundred mitigators. I mean, I don't see, the, yeah, and, and, and the and this so, is a factor here. It's the aggravator versus the mitigation. Well, right. It will just, well, to the point of whether or not it was prop, whether or not it would have been proper to depart downward from the lowest permissible sentence, that is the culpability, the, the record has to show that you were culpable. In this case, you had evidence by two eyewitnesses that said, no, 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 the defendant was ahead of the co-defendant just prior to the, 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 the being hit. Okay, so you have a discrepancy even within the plea colloquy. You also had video evidence which, which was, was shown just prior to the the, the hitting that the judge got a chance to review. The judge looked at this video. The judge heard the colloquy. The uh, and the, and the biggest thing of all, of course, is when it comes to whether they equally culpable is one defendant hit the, 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 the victims, the other one didn't. And so, I, your opponent's position on that, I think, and these, this is my extrapolation, not his, but this is my read of it is that in the passage of another 15 seconds or the shortage of 15 seconds, it could have been either of them. It was just a question of how the events transpired in the time that they did, where they were on the road, it, Barano was in front, Barano was in back. It, and in the, the way you charge these defendants, it took both of them to commit the crime. So this was just a random happenstance of timing and logistics, effectively, not something that would distinguish between their culpability. That's what I think is a key aspect of your opponent's position. So, and that's what he's saying, I think, that the trial court, where the trial court abused its discretion with regard to essentially issue two. Well, whether the, the issue is what does the record show beyond reasonable doubt? Not hypothetically what could have happened. That's not what we're debating. We're debating what does the record show? And that's what the state is presenting, that there were not, the record supports that court's finding that they were not equally culpable. In addition to that, they weren't similarly situated. Sanders says that, that they both have to be equally culpable and similarly situated. The, the glaring difference here is at the time of the offense, the co-defendant was a juvenile, the, but, and, but he, they waived youthful offender for him to on the plea bargain, didn't they? He was not sentenced as a youthful offender. He, as part of the plea, but he was well, charged as an adult. He was right? charged he as an adult, but, but, but the court, he, but the co-defendant could have pre-negotiated. And in addition to that, this was a negotiated plea, guilty plea by the co-defendant. That unto itself. Is a legal basis for departure, which 
the defendant did not have a, a right to. So that, that's another distinguishing uh, fact between the two. But the whole context of, of the juvenile versus adult, you know, the, the, the focus on the juvenile sentencing, frankly, is on rehabilitation. With adult, it's punishment. So pre-cooperation pre with the state by the co-defendant, they could have, uh, they could have requested the court use its discretion and apply downward sanctions. Absolutely, they had every right to do so. Not by the defendant, maybe youthful offender, but not juvenile sanctions. That was not an option for the defendant. It was for the co-defendant. Totally different situation. The, um, but, but even, you know, argumentally, if you want to say, well, they're equally culpable, it's still harmless. This court still had the pure discretionary determination whether or not it should depart in this so case, another, even if the court accepted all six. Another judge, similarly situated for lack of a better term, could have gone the other way. So this, judge judge, this judge, who was on the ground, looking these people in the eye, looking at all the evidence, this is what he decided to do. And your position is that that was well within his discretion and proper under the guiding law, most specifically probably Sanders. Am I right? That's correct. And to your point about whether or not there was racing, it was there any case law on racing the departure? I couldn't find any case law strictly on this purely departure. Is there ever a case where a court trial court was reversed on a purely discretionary Review well, that, that it under it. should have the uh, that's an bank step two. No, just just a just an aside type question. So, if the judge did down with the part, you wouldn't be filing an appeal because there was a legal basis. That there was a legal basis, it, and you and you're stuck with that. I mean, usually down with departure, if a ground doesn't exist, the state can appeal that and get and get a reversal, but not if a down departure ground exists and you don't like to. The sentence. It was, a, it was a subjective call, a uh, judgment call made by the trial court. That's not reviewable. This was not a abuse of discretion in the context of the court somehow didn't apply its its just did not apply its discretion from a due process standpoint. Well, that, that that's what makes an issue two and one to separate out the second issue and say disparity of sentence. Then that that might be an abuse of discretion. I, I just don't know of any case law other than death penalty cases where you have a right to equal sentencing. Your Honor, the Supreme Court of Florida no longer even considers proportionality. The Lawrence opinion, Lawrence versus State, 308, 3rd, 554, the 2020 case, the Florida Supreme Court no longer considers comparative proportionality of the sentencing as part of its review. So the Supreme Court doesn't even recognize proportionality review anymore. So that's, your, that's kind of your response in a nutshell to issue number two? Well, so for number three, three, for sure. sure. Uh, okay. Excuse me, uh, to number two. And if, if you're saying, well, if the if the argument, uh, with all due respect, to me, it wasn't clear in the initial brief where, where this proportionality argument is coming in, but I can only assume that looking at the case law of proportionality analysis, the old proportionality analysis, that was the last step after the court reviewed aggravators and mitigators, then finally you get the proportionality uh, analysis under the Eighth Amendment, which has now been taken out. But besides that, um, uh, you could, I guess the, 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 the argument is that, okay, they're not equally uh, culpable. However, they're relatively culpable or comparably uh, culpable. And in that case, uh, yeah, we'll, we'll, we, the court should have applied a proportionality analysis and so on and so forth. But, but again, the just that was factored in in the sentence, and the judge didn't give out the maximum sentence. Or no, it's a mid, no. mid range sentence. The judge is within the guideline sentence. The, the lowest permissible sentence was 18.5. The statutory max was 30. The trial court. Well, that shows that really gave 24. The abuse of discretion didn't really exist because maybe an abuse of discretion would be just the maximum without consideration for the, the disparity in conduct. If the court didn't do its job does it make and, a, and, and, and apply, its, apply its discretion, of course, you know what, I'm dying with these, uh, these regular homicide racing cases. 
Throw the book. You're not letting go look at it. You're bad, of course. Right. Does it make a difference? Does it make a difference to your analysis that the other mitigator, or I think most of the other mitigators, not all of them, are statutory? And this one, this disparity, is judge made law. Does that in any way change your analysis? I'm going to ask your opponent to address that on um, um, rebuttal. I, I don't think so. Because I think I, what made me ask you that question is your, or maybe brought the question to my mind, was your argument that the Supreme Court no longer re recognizes proportionality, right. which take that out to its logical conclusion, this body of judge-made law could be eroding before our very eyes as a mitigator at all. Well, again, uh, without going too deep into the weeds of proportionality, which is kind of moving at this point, um, again, proportionality, analysis is um, distinct because you're going beyond weighing aggravators and mitigators in this case. Proportionality now, you're reviewing cheats in all these supreme uh, death penalty cases. Let's take, take a look at the situation because death is different, right? We don't have a chance, to, an opportunity to downward depart. You're either getting life or you're getting death. And so uh, from that, that's why the, there was a Proportionality analysis on the paper and so forth, but it, it, it doesn't really apply. First of all, it's it's gone. It's not longer considered by the Florida Supreme Court. In addition, here that's not really an obligation. What the court had to do, the court had to look at the facts in this case and, and weigh and weigh, which the court did painstakingly in the record, the aggravators and the mitigators in this case. Uh, we're dealing with, you know. We're dealing with uh, 102 miles an hour on Bayshore Boulevard at 11 o'clock, 11.30 in the morning. Everybody knows Bayshore Boulevard, what goes on. I'm sure everybody's walked Bayshore Boulevard, bikes. It's just gotten more and more packed over the years. It's when I used to live on Bayshore Boulevard. Um, that was egregious to go that kind of speed on that particular. We're not talking in the middle of some rural road out in the middle of Cook County somewhere. We're talking about Bayshore Boulevard. Second, the impact, the victim, the harm in this particular case, the mother, Egregious. an infant, uh, an infant, I mean, the whole family's wiped out. So to say that no reasonable juror would rule the way this court ruled, the court just, I mean, the state just doesn't agree with that. Any questions? No, thank you. <laughs> This is just giving you, I saved you five minutes. Thank you, Your Honor. One or two factual comments. Number one, we believe the videos help us a lot. There were videos from several residences along Bay Shore Boulevard. They're not the best, but what they show are the two cars going and they're like zoom, zoom, right behind each other. The detective, uh, homicide detective Jakes, testified that the Nissan at all times was right behind, during these times was right behind uh, the Mustang. They were very, very, very close to each other at the time of impact. If you have one of these things you see on NASCAR where they have the arrow pointing at the car and the distance between two cars, you'd have one second. We've done time and distance measurements. They're like a second behind each other uh, along the way here. And I just do not see the difference in culpability. If that is the aggravator, the aggravator being that my client struck the, the, the two people. But I, I just don't see how within a second or two or three, it could have been the other. Two peas in a pot, two cars driving together. And that's what turned everything that the state has said in the, in the according to its limited reasons is my client's car struck the people, the other car didn't. Therefore, night and day difference, six years here, 24 years here. You know, they had, they had to nail somebody here really bad. And we know that. And that is, my client was the scapegoat because at the last second, he's the one that hit. Verno would be up there making the same argument, I suspect, if the rules had been a couple seconds uh, later. Also, when it comes to abuse of discretion, when you look at Huff and Banks, you know, the, court, the Supreme Court talks about that discretionary power is not without limitation. And the test requires a determination of whether there is logic and justification for the result. And I think in this instance, where we prove five out of six, where the judge said, I agree with you, 
you 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 did it. You you did it right. And then disparity was the only one he didn't agree on. That's a lot farther than most of us have done in many, many, many cases. But I just don't see the daylight here. And to give this young man, you know, death is different, I agree. But to give this young man 20 years old, 24 years in prison, he had just graduated from Tampa Catholic. He's never been in trouble. No alcohol or drugs involved in this case by anybody. Well, let me ask you a question. Would your argument be the same if the co-defendant got 24 years in prison also? Oh, it would. Did the other person get off too easy or your client got, got way out of proportion? I assume you're focusing on the latter. Yeah, that's a hard one to answer. I mean, I would probably say- I'm just saying that takes your thunder away. Well, I say that, screwed up in the first case. But, but the state felt the six years was entirely appropriate for- It was a negotiated plea. And the court approved it. So the court obviously approved it. But you're not here on that case. So I don't want to. No. And, and the court was, I mean, the court was going to approve it. There's no doubt. And it was, it, it, it they, they wanted my client. They, and they reached the agreement with the other one, knowing that we were going to plead anyway. I mean, it was. Well, was there part of the agreement that the other client, the other co-defendant would be required to testify well, if your client chose to go to trial? Technically, yes, but really, no. He wasn't going to testify. They never listed him as a witness. He and the debriefing. You see, you see what I'm saying? Though? That's that's another factor that that no one's really uh, argued. And we assume that's a factor because he pled out. He doesn't have a, a Fifth Amendment right at that point. It, it's a smoke screen, Your Honor, because the as we understand we got a Brady uh, statement that uh, they did a very quick debrief, they being the state of Barano. Barano said we were not racist. And they weren't going to call him in 100 million years. Uh, the uh, So, uh, and it was a kind of strange proffer. The prosecutor went over to the defense lawyer's office. The, the police officer, the detective, uh, Jakes didn't even know about it. It was window dressing. That's what it was. It was window dressing. You got and, to about a half a minute. I don't want to stop so, you, but. Uh, well, I, I, I guess the point I would like to make as much as I can is that there's no daylight, like I've said a couple of times, between these two, these two young men. If they're equally culpable, and I believe if they're equally culpable, then this sentence of 24 years versus six is excessive. And Thank you. Thank you. If I could conclude, Judge, with one comment. I've been privileged to practice this profession that I've loved for over 45 years. This is the case that keeps me awake at night and always will. Thank you. Well, thank you for telling us. Uh, take the next case. I, if I mispronounce the name of the next case, I apologize. It's Radu versus Crasium and Nicoletta versus Russo. All right. As soon as they clear out, you can come on up.